Now, talk to us about, you know, as as far as autoimmunity goes, we have a condition that that's autoimmune that can affect blood sugar, type one diabetes. So, what's the difference between people with type one diabetes versus type two? For sure. Well, type one diabetes, autoimmune mediated, where the immune system will actually attack and destroy the beta cells in the pancreas that produce insulin. And so, with these individuals. They are not producing insulin. So if we were to look at their fasting insulin levels on blood work, their insulin would be basically just about zero, right? So usually if it's like under two, sometimes they're sputting out just a tiny bit, but not enough to actually bring blood sugar down and stabilize blood sugar. So those individuals have uh, type 1 diabetes, autoimmune mediated, whereas a type 2 diabetes, they're actually producing too much insulin. So these people, well, late stage, they don't produce insulin, but Oftentimes, we see insulin really, really high for these individuals, but their cells are not responding to it because their cells are insulin resistant. So they have to produce a ton of insulin in order to get any sort of, you know, insulin's job is to get sugar out of the bloodstream and put it into the cells, right? It's trying to, pre pre it's trying to prevent the formation of these advanced glycation end products. So it takes the sugar molecules, puts them into the cells. So over time, though, if we constantly have high blood sugar, we're constantly producing insulin, the cells start to downregulate insulin receptors. They start to become less responsive to the insulin. It's kind of like if somebody's always knocking on your door in the beginning, you're sensitive to the knock. After a while, you just forget about it. You know, I've got young kids around, you know, I've got four young kids. So, you know, when somebody screams or yells, like initially I might, I might, you know, respond to it. But a lot of times my kids are just running around yelling the whole time. And I just completely, I completely ignore it. I have to block it out so I can work. And so it's kind of like the same thing with our cells. They start to block out the message of insulin. And now the body's producing more and more insulin. And then ultimately with type two diabetes, a lot of times the pancreas just, just fatigues or it's not getting the right messages to produce insulin. And then insulin can drop in later stage uh, type two diabetes. And so type one, no insulin production, little to no insulin production type two, typically too much insulin production until late stage where we see a reduction. Now there is a form of type of type two diabetes that is autoimmune. It's thought to be at least autoimmune mediated. Typically with type one diabetes this is something people develop early in life. We call it juvenile diabetes. So usually first five years of life or so that individual will be diagnosed Whereas type two diabetes and autoimmune mediated type two diabetes is going to be later in life, right? So um, that's going to happen down the road where that individual has diabetes, they have prediabetes for a period of time. And then eventually um, the immune system starts to attack the pancreas, wears it down, and then the pancreas shuts down. So it's usually a process that takes a little bit longer. Whereas type one, it's kind of like this massive attack on the pancreas early in life that shuts down pancreas or the beta cell pancreatic function of insulin very early in life. Type one, typically juvenile onset. And then type two is where in poor diet and sedentary activity eventually leads to insulin resistance. And then we have that type 1.5 that you just talked about, the latent yeah. uh, adult autoimmune uh, di diabetes, which are called LADA, L-A-D-A. Yeah. And that's what you're describing there, where basically you get that autoimmune diabetes later on in life, where you have pancreatic destruction. And just for people to know that these are um, the autoimmune diabetes is, is signified by not only high blood sugar, but also very low insulin. Typically, by the time you get to autoimmune, because of the pancreatic destruction, and yep. there are uh, antibody tests that you can do. You can test for islet cell, uh, islet cell antibodies. You can test for uh, zinc transporter eight antibodies. You can test for actually insulin antibody. One of the markers that for um, aut autoimmune diabetes is that you can have autoimmune to your own insulin, and that's actually uh, something that can a mechanism for for autoimmune. So now th those are just great information. Now talk to us about. I mean, there's actually as we talk about the different types of diabetes, what type one, type two, type one point five. Is also the type three. So talk to us about type three diabetes, Dr. Yeah, Tom. type three diabetes is going to be diabetes of the brain. So just like we were talking about the brain cells, they really need 
a continuous supply of glucose. Now they can run off glucose. They can also run off of ketones as well, but they always need at least 50% of their energy supply to be run off of glucose. And in order to get ketones as an alternative fuel source, you actually need to be in a place where you have very low insulin. And then what happens is your body will take fatty acids, convert them in the liver into water-soluble molecules called ketones that are smaller than fatty acids. And then those can actually cross the blood-brain barrier because normal cells can run off of glucose or fatty acids. However, we can't get the fatty acids, the long chain fatty acids up through the blood-brain barrier effectively. And that's why the body makes ketones. However, when somebody's insulin resistant, when they have higher insulin, their body's not going to burn fat effectively for fuel and they're not going to produce ketones. So in this case, if blood sugar is dropping too low or if the neurons themselves are very insulin resistant and they're not responding to insulin, we're not getting the glucose into the neurons at the rate that we need in order to provide the necessary fuel for the neurons. They can't produce the ATP that they need. And then they start to build up toxicity, build up uh, all these different metabolic end products. And then ultimately they end up dying and spilling out their contents, just like I was talking about with hypoglycemia, creating this neuroexcitotoxic uh, effect that damages all the cells around them. And ultimately this leads to neurodegeneration. Um, in particular, Alzheimer's is the most well-studied when it comes to insulin resistance, but there's also strong links with dementia, with uh, all different forms of dementia, as well as with uh, things like Parkinson's disease, ALS, a lot of these different neurodegenerative conditions, uh, strong links with insulin resistance. I think it's important for the audience to know that the neurodegenerative processes typically involve some type of inflammatory process. And, and really, both inflammatory process and neurodegenerative process can either lead into autoimmunity of the brain and autoimmunity of the brain can also lead to inflammation of the brain, which can accelerate neurodegeneration. So really they all kind of run together because it's an immune system that's become overzealous. The inflammation is really just an immune response. If it's overzealous, then it creates tissue destruction. And then we have the neurodegeneration and then drive more tissue damage, which can drive more autoimmunity. For now, sure. You know, when those neurons, when those neurons die and they release their contents, not only does it overexcite the neurons around them, but it also, you know, it, they're releasing these damage associated molecular patterns that are then picked up by the immune system. And that tells the immune system, hey, there's damage here. We need to start actually, you know, cleaning up this tissue. We want to make sure that this area doesn't get infected. We want to make sure this is part of the healing process. The problem is that, you know, it's all, it's just releasing so many compounds and it's affecting all the neurons around it, creating this kind of chronic inflammatory process. 